Hi everyone and welcome to this week's design challenge. We are looking at Fantasio, which is an opera by Offenbach, and it means the king of fools, Fantasio. A princess has to marry a prince to basically keep peace between two nations. She doesn't actually want to get married, so you can see that this story is going to be a really exciting one to explore in Monday Motivation. Now, this is a great opera production to work on because Frances O'Connor's designs are extraordinary and beautiful and we have got Ivy Bridgewater Court with us today who's a costume maker who worked on the production at Garsington. Hi Ivy. Hello. I'm absolutely desperate to ask you what the difference between a costume maker and designer is. So the designer they come up with the whole concept at the start. So they create the drawings and the images that inspire the whole thing. And then the maker is more about translating what they've drawn into something real life. And how fantastic that you've got some of the actual costumes with you there in your house. That's gorgeous. Was it a great show to work on? Yes, I really enjoyed working on it and it's just such a fabulous set of designs. Some, some shows are more about subtlety, but this one was very much a bold, big design with some sort of cartoonish elements, some wonderful things that are just so obvious in these costumes. There was very much a strong colour theme for these as well. So as you can see, this costume is all in this purple and the blue, as is there another costume here. These are both chorus We've got um, a picture, haven't we, of the yeah. chorus in this show. So let's show that picture. Beautiful. So I can see exactly what you're talking about in terms of the colours and how vibrant those costumes are. It's beautiful. Is the colour theme something that you had to focus on? Um, it was very much something we were considering the whole time because um, it came into all of the different characters. So we had to when choosing the fabrics and all of that, we had to take everything with us all of the time to keep referencing and make sure it all matched. We've got a picture of one of the principal characters as well, haven't we, from Frances O'Connor's design. Can you tell us a little bit about that one? So this one is Flamel, and he's kind of like halfway between the designs of the two. So you can see he's got a more interesting design than some of the um, chorus men, for example, but he's still in their color world. So he works for the lead character. Fantastic. And what would you say was the concept of the design? I think it was kind of, there's a hint of Bavaria, there's a hint of 1700s, and it, then it's in this exaggerated cartoony world to kind of create what we've got here. Got another photograph of the designer's drawing that demonstrates that cartoon world. Look at this character. I just love it. I would, I would so love to put that costume on. It's fantastic. <laughs> Um, so how would you go about making a costume like that? You're given a drawing, presumably, and then what happens? So when you're given the drawing, you'll have a meeting with the designer or with the costume supervisor who works with the designer to work out what it is specifically that they're going for. And from that, you will then go away and start drafting a pattern um, to start creating the piece. So, so you have to make, you look at a drawing and then you yourself would then have to make a pattern from that. You don't get given a pattern to actually make. So the designer always makes kind of the concept art, as it were, but they don't tend to do something like a technical drawing that would give you more of how it's physically made. That's up to the maker. So the supervisor usually will have taken a set of measurements and from those measurements you make a pattern to start making the costume. So that's such a creative role in itself, isn't it? And we've got a photograph of the Jester costume design that you're talking about and you've shown us there on your rail. How was it making this costume? What was special about it? So this costume was made by Elsa Threadgold. And this was particularly interesting because as you can see from the design, it's got so many different elements. It's mixed and matched. And the fabric itself was also made. It didn't, this doesn't exist on its own. So we had to make that up and then shit. So with this one, the pattern at first would have been quite simple, but it needed to be cut from all the different bits of fabric. So the pattern at first for this one would have looked like this. I'll explain what it looks like in a minute. So this is the front line right down the middle of the person. This is their neck and that is the armhole. 
And from this, you can see it's got quite a high neck. So this shape would stay quite true. But if you're drafting something like this one, it's got such a different shape that you would more want to cut all the way down like that to make this big square opening here and open this out to make a smaller armhole. And what do you do once you've drawn that on the paper? I can't imagine having to do that. So once you've done that, you cut up all of these pieces of paper and you put them on fabric and you cut them from the fabric, leaving a little bit spare so that you can to, to allow for the sewing. Does it ever go wrong? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> we aim for it not to. <laughs> so what is particularly interesting about the Jester costume, I know that you were, you've got a photograph, haven't you, of some of the fabrics that went into that costume. It's, wow, so that's one, two, three, four, five, six, eight different fabrics, is that right? Yes. This section is two different fabrics that had to be sewn together in strips to make a new fabric, and this is a full patchwork made entirely from all of those different bits. Whoa, did it take a long time to make? That would have taken a very long time. Yeah, and at Garsington, um, they have a freelance team of makers across the productions on the seasons, don't they? And there were 20, on average, there's about 20 costume makers on, on uh, uh, the season. Sometimes those costumes are fully made and sometimes they're hired. For Fantasio, were any of them hired? I think, as, as, as far as I remember, the entire show was made because it was Whoa. such a specific world that you couldn't find this anywhere else. And what did you make? I made a set of ruffs. So these characters had a kind of festival outfit that had ruffs and mad sleeves. And these were so much effort we couldn't give them to the maker for the costumes. I think let's just check what we mean by a rough. We've got a photograph of one of the designs, haven't we? And you can see on the left side of that picture, it's the black rough around that chorus member's neck. Is that right? Yes. So you will have seen these in a much more white and big form in paintings in, than portrait gallery or whatever. Um, but in this, he wanted them to be big, mad things. So the ones we made had lots of braid around them to be multicoloured and they had lace edging and all of that kind of stuff. How do you make it? They take a very long time. It's one of those things that's technically a simple process but you could be doing it for a very long time. So you take a piece of a long, long, long piece. I've made a very small version out of paper here for you. So this is 1.3 meters and you fold it up, concertina fold like that, so it zigzags, and you end up with this. And all of that length went in to make this small rough. Whoa, and how many of those did you have to make? Um, there were 10 on the show. I made four of them and we were all making them by the end because we just had so many to get through. I see. And is that now the costume made, the chorus costume finished? Well, the rough is only part of it and that came straight off and also this bit came off. So these costumes were made to change over quite quickly so that they could play multiple things. So this is their villager version, but they also played. So this would be a quick change, presumably, backstage. Yes, so these were all quick changed off. So it came off and instead they became courtiers, which means they got a much fancier top. Oh, very nice. That looks particularly, it's quite tight, isn't it, on the top? And then it looks, yeah, a kind of bigger skirt. So these were really tight bodices at the top and then these skirts have so many layers of net in them and underneath each of these plumes is also a big gathered bunch of net. And net on its own is quite flat, but when you take it, you do a very simple thing of stitching two long lines of stitching and then you pull one of them and you can gather it all up. To make cool. this, which will add so much more texture underneath and help things layer all the way out. And that looks like that top part might have a corset in. Is that right? Would it have been uncomfortable to wear that? So yes, these had the bones made into them so that we could change them over. 
and they I remember during rehearsals they were quite uncomfortable for to stay in for such a long period of time. Would you be able to sort of just show us a few corsets just so we can see what they're like? And yes, what type so of is? you will see a few photos here yeah so this first one is from 1660 and it's towards the beginning of this kind of shape of, of corset these are called stays and that you can see how long it is in the front there and it that one comes all the way around the arms as well so you wouldn't be able to move at all you don't really move your arms because women are demure in this time so you can only really use your hands to do this kind of thing and you can't because that's so long it goes all the way down your body so you can't really bend forward at all so it's very much for you to just glide and stand very still whilst other people are around you um, the next picture is of a more 1700s one. This is a slightly more generic one that we'd use in costume rather than being a very specific period. But this is from the 1700s, so it's still got that very obvious V shape at the front, but it's nowhere near as long, so there is that bit more movement, and the arms aren't caught in here, they're suddenly up here, so the woman can move her arms. She's still tight in, she can't just bend however she wants, she's still quite constricted, but she can lean forward, and she can lift her arms at this point. And then if we move on to the next one, this is sort of mid 1800s. I'm sorry, there's only half a corset, but that is what I have. Um, and you can see the silhouette has changed a lot. So previously it's been a very straight line down to the waist and then it stops. And then there's a longer bit at the front, whereas this takes the whole length and makes a much smoother curve. I'm really fascinated by the way that you say they affect movement and actually different periods in history controlling the way that women moved. So I think that's quite interesting to look at. And did you make the corset for this? Because you said a lot of the costumes in Fantasio were actually handmade. So I can make a corset. I didn't make these ones, but yes, these have got little bones either side. So um, I can demonstrate to you a little bit of corset. So this will be me making the back section. So if you can see in this small camera, there's this would be a bone either side and then this is where all the eyelets go so that, so that at the back you can thread all the lacing through and do it up so you do a line of stitching go back at the top so it stays and clip that and then you take your piece of bone and I'll do it in the small I'll do it in the big camera. and you can post the bone down through the top and now rather than a floppy bit of fabric you've got a much firmer and stronger piece so this is bone that would have gone into the thing to make it more rigid and for hold the form of these extreme shapes so they used to use what's called whale bone but that's a bit of a misnomer because it's not actually bone. It's baleen, which is made of keratin, like your fingernails, which is the teeth of a whale. So it would be taken in long strips and it's really quite soft and manual and would get softer as it's worn because it reacts to the warmth of the body. We obviously cannot use that anymore. It's completely illegal and has stopped being used, but it still exists in some very old pieces of, of fashion. What we have now is this plastic bone which is recreated to be as close to that as we can. So it's really quite malleable, but it doesn't really bend sideways at all. It just bends like that. So that if you use loads of pieces of it, you make quite a firm shape. There are other things that people have used as bone as well to make up for this and before plastic was being used as much. So we've got here flat steel, which has been made. Now this, it is metal and it is quite hard and it would have dug in quite badly when worn and it's nowhere near as forgiving. So that's as much bend as I can get on that as opposed to this big curve here. Now, another thing we use as well, because in some of the shapes, especially in that Victorian one where it's so curved, it moves a lot and it wants to curve in multiple directions. So there's this thing called spiral steel boning. Now this is, it makes of course it quite heavy but it also bends really nicely. So it's got quite a lot of give that way, but also you can bend this sideways. So it's much more forgiving and trustworthy. Like you can really tell what it's gonna do. So I can completely see Ivy, why when I'm watching period dramas, kind of 18th century stories, sometimes the women faint, because that must have been pretty painful from what you're describing there. 
yes <laughs> breathing is constricted and it's very painful yeah that must be really difficult for singers how do you how do you cope with that because they have to expand don't they Yes, yeah, so this is very much singer by singer. When you are dressing them, you will work out how they wear it. Because some people really like having that firm thing to press against, against their diaphragm. So they can sing against it and use it as this pressure point. But other people find it's really too constricting on their lungs, so they can't breathe deep enough. So you have a conversation with that singer and see if they would like to be slightly looser or slightly tighter. And sometimes you might use elastic cord in the back so that you've just got a little bit more movement. Fascinating. And how long would it have taken to make a corset like this? Um, a, to make a corset takes a day or two. Depends how quickly you work and which specific style. Because obviously the older corsets have a lot more bones in, so that's a lot more sewing to do. And how many days per costume then? Oh, so these, if you were to make them start to finish all in one go, then maybe two to three, maybe four days. But that doesn't tend to be how it works because you'll have a first fitting where you've got a rough idea of the shape of it. And then you'll come back and you'll carry on making it and then you'll go and have another fitting to check. Ivy, it's absolutely fascinating how much goes into making of all these costumes. We go to productions and we see this wonderful, wonderful spectacle of design. And I thought that the designer would just be doing all of that. And it's so interesting that there are all these other roles and jobs of, of what's happening backstage. So thank you so much for really unlocking us, uh, unlocking that for us and showing us. And what for you, Ivy, is the most exciting thing about your job? What do you love most about it? I really like creating something, making it really happen and giving someone that moment of wearing something they've fantasised about wearing about. Um, with Garsington specifically, I really love it as a venue. It's all outdoors and beautiful. And I also work during the show shows. I work backstage in the wardrobe department, which is a different department. And I think my favourite is just as the show is starting, you can hear the overture playing and all of the performers are with you backstage just about to go on and there's this really strong buzz. I can see that because I've got a photograph of you backstage. I wonder if this is the moment when the curtain's about to go up and the <laughs> show starts. This is Ivy celebrating by the looks of thing backstage. Fantastic. It has been so great to have you with us today and you've really shown us some beautiful things and inspired us. So thank you so much, Ivy. And we will see you all for Monday Motivation on the production of Fantasio. Bye.